Hello and welcome to episode 29 of Sam Splaining Science. I'm Sam, I'm your host, I'll be Sam Splaining the Science, and today we're talking about alcohol and alcohol use disorder. Let's get into it. Hi everyone, how are you? I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well too, thanks for asking. Um, not many updates, not many life updates going on right now. I'm recording on a Sunday morning, super last minute, but I'm hoping to get this to you by Sunday night. Um, the weekend is quickly approaching its end, um, and I want to get an episode to you before the weekends. So tomorrow's Labor Day, so day off of work, going to hang out chill. I hope you all have a nice Labor Day if you're observing. If you're not observing, just use it as, it as an excuse to do nothing anyway. Pro tip. Yeah, so like I said, this episode we're going to talk about alcohol and alcohol use disorder. Um, I actually wrote a piece for my postdoc uh, office blog Um, about alcohol use disorder this week, so I'm sort of double dipping, um, as I've done a couple of times in the past. Um, I'll link that below if you want to read it. It's like just a short summary of a paper that talked about alcohol use disorder, and we'll get into it later in the episode, Um, but I figured it would be a good excuse to double dip and talk about alcohol. We've never talked about alcohol on the show before, so I thought it would be good. Um, But if you have any suggestions for future topics... Let me know. You can connect with me on social media at SamSplainingSci, or you can also submit questions at samsplainingscience.com slash ask. Those can be anonymous, by the way. If you have a question and you're like, oh, I don't want her to think I'm stupid. I don't want her to think this is a stupid question. First of all, I wouldn't. But um, you can ask anonymous questions there if you want to uh, retain your anonymity. Um... Okay, so without further ado, we will get into today's questions about alcohol and alcohol use disorder. This episode today has two questions. The first is a multi-part question, as my questions often are. The first question is, what is alcohol and how does it affect our body? And then the second question is, what is alcohol use disorder and how is it diagnosed and how is it treated? So we'll jump right into question one. Question one, what is alcohol? Alcohol is an organic compound, um, which means that it has a carbon atom in the compound. That's what organic means when we're talking about like chemistry-based things. Um, So it's an organic compound. It contains carbon. And what makes it an alcohol is the on one of the carbons, one or more carbons of the uh, molecule. Words are hard this early in the morning. Um, <laughs> on one of the carbons in the molecule, there is a there is a hydroxyl group attached, where a hydroxyl group is equal to an oxygen bound to a hydrogen. So um, if you're watching, which by the way, you can watch on YouTube. You can YouTube uh, Sam Explaining Science and find the more recent episodes there. Um, I have an example on the slide of ethanol. Ethanol has two carbons in its carbon backbone. And one of the carbons, uh, carbon can make four bonds. Um, We can get into some gen chem, I guess. Carbon atoms can bind, can make a total of four bonds. So sometimes carbons can be bound to four H's. That's CH4. Um, That's methane gas, I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong. Um, But it can make a total of four bonds, right? So a carbon, ethanol here has two carbons. So the two carbons are bound to each other. That's one bond each. And then one of the carbon is bound to three hydrogens. And then the other carbon is bound to two hydrogens and then a hydroxyl group with the OH bound to it. Um, And this is called ethanol. Ethanol 
is found in wine, beer, and liquor that we consume. It is the alcohol of the alcohol that we think of. So when we drink wine, beer, liquor, etc., ethanol is the thing that we're ingesting that goes into our digestive system. It absorbs into our bloodstream, and it sort of spreads all over the body, wherever the blood is, right? So that is alcohol. The next question is, how does alcohol affect the body? So we can measure the alcohol level in the blood, which is known as the blood alcohol concentration or the BAC. And when alcohol is consumed, oftentimes there are impairments that come along with that. The impairments from alcohol exposure, like drunkenness, um, And other complications from drinking too much alcohol are associated with the BAC. And we'll get into this more in a little bit, but basically the more alcohol that is in the bloodstream, the more problems and potentially complications there will be. So I have a figure here from the NIAAA. Um, This is the National Institute for Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. It's one of the institutes at the National Institutes of Health. Um, And... Actually, this is going to be the source for a lot of the information that I shared today is the NIAAA. Um, But they have this figure here that I am showing on the slide that sort of of shows, it does show, not sort of, it does show that as blood alcohol concentration increases, there are different levels of impairment, right? So obviously if we have no alcohol in our blood, our blood alcohol concentration is 0%. Um, but as we start drinking, maybe, oh my goodness, what is up with me today? I'm sorry. So as we start drinking and consuming a drink, maybe two drinks, the amount of alcohol in our circulation is increasing. Um, so we start off with like a mild impairment and the mild impairment is where alcohol can be like kind of fun. You know, it's like if you've ever had alcohol and like drank alcohol after a drink or two you're like relaxed maybe you're more social it's like fun right that's like the happy zone where it's like okay you know you're you're not destructive um you're just sort of like enjoying yourself um there might be mild speech uh impairments or mild coordination impairments but otherwise it's like kind of chill um so that's between zero and zero point 0.05% blood alcohol content is equivalent to like, you know, one drink, two drinks, um, depending on the person. It depends also on like your, like how much you've eaten that day. It depends on your body size. It depends on how quickly you can metabolize alcohol. So there are a lot of, uh, factors that can go into determining the blood alcohol content or blood alcohol concentration. But typically when it's below 0.05, you're fun. You're fine. You know, maybe a little bit of coordination issue, but overall, like you're pretty much aware and able to do things. Once you get between 0.06 and 0.15, that's what they call increased impairment. And that's when we see things like impairments in driving skills. So you might've heard of the blood alcohol content in the context of um, like DUIs and like if your blood alcohol content is over 0.08 when you're driving, you're drunk driving. Um, so, you know, when we get past like 0.06, we're starting to see more impairments in um, coordination, in motor ability, um, and things like that. Uh, when we get over 0.16% blood alcohol content, that's where we start to see severe impairment. And this is where it gets really, really dangerous to the drunk person themselves, right? Um, So, you know, again, things like coordination and balance and speech are all impaired. Oftentimes with severe impairment levels, we'll start to see like vomiting or signs of alcohol overdose, which we'll get into later. Um, And then once the blood alcohol content concentration is over 0.31%, that's where we start to see like life-threatening effects 
Um, so danger of death or permanent brain damage, loss of consciousness, uh, things like that. So that's sort of the backbone, I guess, of um, blood alcohol content. But the more that you drink, the more the BAC rises, and then the more negative effects you feel is the main takeaway from this figure. Um, but I also wanted to talk about how alcohol affects the body in more acute or short-term effects, and then also break it down into the more chronic or like long-term effects of drinking alcohol. So if we're drinking just like one night on a single point in time, what is happening in our body when we are drinking and consuming alcohol and it's raising the BAC in our bloodstreams? So as I mentioned, if we don't drink too much, um, initially the effects aren't that bad, right? There might be a little bit of, you know, a slurred speech or a little bit of a, you know, inability to balance or pay attention, but nothing dramatic, nothing like you can't hold yourself up. And actually it's more like fun. It's relaxation. There's social benefits, but once you drink more than you should, um, you'll start noticing slower response times, which again is why like you shouldn't be operating a vehicle or heavy machinery when you're drunk because your response times are very slow. Um, you'll have poor coordination and poor decision making. Um, and then if we drink way, way, way too much, we'll see alcohol overdose, which is also known as alcohol, alcohol poisoning. Um, so those are the acute short-term effects. The more chronic long-term effects um, of drinking a lot of alcohol over time, this is over like years and years and years, um, affect a variety of health conditions, including like your heart, liver, your brain, and can also lead to some types of cancers. So for your heart, <clears throat> drinking a lot over a long period of time can is associated with high blood pressure, stroke, and cardiomyopathy, which is essentially the heart muscle, the myocardium, is uh, stretching and droop, and it's not as strong as it should be. Um, and then drinking too much on a single occasion, and anecdotally, I can, I can contest, well, not contest, a test. I'm not contesting this. I'm a testing it. Um, Drinking too much on a single occasion can lead to irregular heartbeats or arrhythmias. So an arrhythmia is basically like when your heart is beating at a pace that it shouldn't be beating at, uh, whether it's too fast or too slow. So tachycardia is when your heartbeat is too fast, and bradycardia is when your heartbeat is too slow. So I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been there. When you've had a little too much to drink and your heart is like palpitating, you know, and you like you feel your heartbeat when you usually don't feel your heartbeat. Um, that's from alcohol use. Um, I'm sure it's pretty well known that use of alcohol over a prolonged period of time also hurts your liver. So your liver is important in alcohol metabolism. Your blood goes to the liver and the liver metabolizes or breaks down things that are in your blood. So it's really your liver's job to like chop up the alcohol that's in our blood and metabolize it and then let us excrete it. Um, so the liver does a, a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to drinking, um, because it does a lot of the work to get us sober again, essentially. Um, so some effects on the liver are like fatty liver disease or steatosis. Um, that's been associated with long-term drinking habits. Um, also cirrhosis of the liver, which is scarring or fibrosis in the liver. Um, that's where like healthy liver tissue is replaced with scarring. Um, and these both impact the ability of the liver to do its job. Um, so not only are we harming the liver long-term or like while we're drinking alcohol and we're overworking it, we're also harming it for the long-term. Um, as I mentioned, some types of alcohol use are associated with types of cancer. According to the National Cancer Institute, there's a strong scientific consensus, this is a direct quote, 
um, a strong scientific consensus that drinking alcohol causes several types of cancer. The U.S. Department of Health lists consumption of alcoholic beverages as a known human carcinogen. Um, this includes head and neck cancer, which includes like your oral cavity, the pharynx, which is like the back of your throat, and then your larynx, which is your voice box. Um, also it can cause esophageal cancer, the cancer of your esophagus, which connects your mouth to your stomach. Um, liver cancer, breast cancer, uh, women who consume one drink per day, at least one drink per day, have a five to 9% greater chance of breast cancer than women who don't drink at all. That was a statistic that they cited. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Although 5% doesn't seem like a lot, um, having a 5% higher risk from drinking alcohol every day, um, is, uh, significant if we're thinking about it in terms of statistics. And then um, finally, they mentioned colorectal cancer is also associated with alcoholic uh, ingestion use. Um, and then finally, long-term heavy drinking can also harm the brain. Um, it can harm the neurons in the brain. So we've talked about neurons a couple times before, but basically they're the cells in the brain that do the Action, right? They have the nerve signals, they fire from one to the other and allow us to do things, essentially, allow us to think things, right? So alcohol use over time can actually shrink the neurons, change their size so that, uh, and that could potentially negatively alter the function of the neuron, um, which could severely affect our everything, right? Can severely affect every function that we do when we use our brains, speech, motion, um, you know, thought processing, things like that. Um, and even acutely, I didn't really say it when we were going through the acute effects, but a lot of those things when we drink too much alcohol and even not too much alcohol have to do with the brain, right? Slow response time, poor coordination and decision-making are all key functions of our brains, right? So even if we're only acutely using alcohol, um, our brain is getting affected by alcohol. Um, you might have heard that like alcohol is depressant. Uh, for some people that might mean that it makes you feel sad or depressed, but what it actually means is that it slows things down. It turns the dial down, potentially shutting things off. Um, so when we're making poor decisions, when we're drunk, um, and I say we, because with ya, <laughs> when we're making poor decisions, when we're drunk, it's because the part of our brain that goes, Hey, maybe I shouldn't jump off a roof into a pool. That part of the brain that's like, Hey idiot, don't do that is asleep. It's turned down. It's depressed. The, the activity of that region is depressed. It's decreased. So we make the bad decision, right? It's not ideal. Um, sometimes it's funny, but more oftentimes it's actually very dangerous to yourself and to others. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, Speaking of parts of your brain turning off, I want to use this question to also talk about alcohol overdose, uh, which is also called alcohol poisoning. So if a person drinks way, way, way too much, there is the possibility of alcohol overdose. And if I can just go back to that figure that I mentioned earlier from the NIAAA, um, when the blood alcohol level gets up to 0 0.16, which is double the legal limit of, um, you know, DUI. Um, it's at that point where there's a risk of, uh, alcohol poisoning. Um, and it only, the risk only gets higher as the blood alcohol level increases past 0 0.31 when it gets to a life threatening level of impairment. Right. So, um, why did I say that? 
Right. So alcohol poisoning is when there's like so, so, so much alcohol in the blood. Um, and when there's this much alcohol in the blood, our brain responds so that the medulla oblongata in our brain stems hit the self-destruct button, essentially. It turns itself off so much that this is a piece of our brain stem, the medulla oblongata, that is responsible for breathing, um, responsible for regulating our blood pressure, responsible for um, setting our heart rate, um, or it can affect our heart rate. So when the medulla is so depressed, when the activity of the medulla is so reduced, because there's so much alcohol in our blood, because there's so much depressant in our system, um, those functions of breathing and blood regulating blood pressure and things like that are reduced as well. Um, and when that happens, we stop breathing. You know, if we're not consciously making the decision to breathe, because usually we don't have to do that, right? We breathe throughout the day without really thinking about it. That's because our medulla is like, hey, idiot, inhale, exhale. Don't forget to do that. Otherwise, we would probably all pass out all the time. If we had to consciously think about breathing while we were doing our jobs or whatever, we would all be passed out. But thank God for the medulla, medulla, however you say it, um, because that keeps us breathing. But when we have too much alcohol, like I was saying, the medulla shuts down, as does many other parts of your brain. And, uh, you know, we start experiencing alcohol poisoning when this happens. So first, the first like symptom of alcohol poisoning is if a person is mentally confused and they have dulled or slow responses. Um, and this is tricky because a lot of even like the mild impairment and like the middle level of impairment of the blood alcohol concentration <clears throat> is, um, that happens, right? People are confused. People have slow responses. Um, but it's when we get to a point where a person drinks so much that they're unable to like remain conscious. If they're like slumped over in a corner and they can't wake up, um, they're not responses. Um, maybe they're not responsive. Is that what I said? I might've said responses. I did not have coffee yet today too. I just want to mention that. Um, <laughs> I should do an episode about coffee and why I'm so dependent on it. Coffee addiction. Hmm. I'll, I'll try to remember that. Um, anyway. Yeah. So we have, when someone is experiencing alcohol poisoning, they'll be unable to stay awake and alert. Maybe their breathing rate will change. Their body temperature will drop. And if it's left untreated, this can lead to severe permanent brain damage or death. So what can we do? If we're out somewhere and we see someone who is unresponsive after drinking an excessive amount of alcohol, what can we do? The NIAAA made it very clear on what not to do, and that is to treat it with things like fresh air, cold showers, and coffee. Um, those are like old wives' tales, like to sober you up, but those things do not get alcohol out of your system. The only thing that can get alcohol out of your system is your liver breaking it down and then your kidneys filtering it out of your blood and you peeing it out. Um, and that takes time. So that's the only thing that can get alcohol out of your system is time. Um, so don't think that like, oh, if I take a cold shower or put them in a cold shower, they'll be fine. No, that's not how that works, unfortunately. Wouldn't it be nice? But no, that's not how it works. Um, so if a person is experiencing symptoms of alcohol poisoning or alcohol overdose, instead of putting them in a cold shower or putting them outside, um, you should bring them to the hospital uh, or get some type of medical intervention for them. For someone that's experiencing an alcohol overdose, they need to be taken to a hospital to make sure that their breathing remains stable um, if not, they can be supplemented with oxygen or they can be intubated even if it get, the breathing rate gets too sporadic. Um, and their heart rate and their blood pressure are monitored and they're at a medical facility so they can intervene if necessary. Medical professionals can intervene if necessary. 
Otherwise, if the person's breathing is too irregular, if their heartbeat is too irregular, they could die. So, um, you know, if, if you or someone you know is experiencing severe impairment after alcohol consumption where they're passing out, um, they're not responsive, they're breathing weird, um, they're vomiting, things like that, go to the hospital, call 911, get medical attention immediately, or else it could result in uh, severe brain damage or death. So that's question one. That was not a very pleasant question one. <laughs> not, not a very pleasant way to end question one. But here we are. Um, what are you going to do? Sometimes it's not sunshine and rainbows. So let's go on to question two, which is about alcohol use disorder. What is alcohol use disorder? It's also known as AUD. People who have AUD, alcohol use disorder, um, typically the characterizing factor of alcohol use disorder is somebody who has had a heavy drinking habit for over one year. And the way that we define a heavy drinking habit is for women having over seven drinks per week. So on average, more than one drink a day. Um, and for men, it's over 14 drinks per week or over uh, two drinks per day. And um, I mean, just thinking about this, you can say it with me on three, one, two, three, misogyny. Um, <laughs> no, you might argue, well, like, oh, men are bigger than women or, you know, they need more alcohol to raise their blood alcohol content. And it's like, okay, but double, double, that seems excessive. And honestly, some could argue women deserve to drink more than men, but I digress. Um, you can imagine that this level of drinking for a person will affect their daily life, their daily activities, um, their relationships to others, their jobs. Um, so it's, it's something that is definitely a cause for concern for people. So it is characterized as a disorder because it greatly impacts uh, the quality of life of the person who has this. According to Dr. Boersma and colleagues, up to 6% of adults in the United States can report heavy or high-risk consumption of alcohol. So this can affect a decent amount of people in this country, this disorder, which can have a great impact on their lives, a great impact, and not in a good way. I mean, great, like, sizable, not great, like, woohoo. Um, it can have a sizable impact on the quality of their life. It can have a, a sizable impact on their health, right, their long-term health. It can have a sizable impact on their relationship with others and their productivity at work and so many other things. So it really is a serious issue to that we need to think about and try to confront. So the next part of question two is how is alcohol use disorder diagnosed? So we can diagnose AUD using the most recent diagnostic statistical manual of mental disorders, which is also known as DSM. The most recent version is the DSM-5. In the DSM-5, there is a questionnaire that we can use to to diagnose alcohol use disorder. And that questionnaire has a 11 questions that are yes or no questions. Uh, some examples of questions that could be asked on the DSM for alcohol use disorder diagnosis is things like, in the last year, have you continued to drink even though it was making you feel depressed or anxious or adding to another health problem? Or have you continued to drink after having a memory blackout? 
Another question could be, in the past year, have you wanted a drink so badly you couldn't think of anything else? Or another question, in the past year, have you more than once wanted to cut down or stop drinking or tried to but could not? So all of these sort of get to different facets of alcohol use disorder, but essentially using alcohol, even if it makes you feel bad, um, being so dependent on alcohol that you're craving it so much that you can't think of anything else until you drink it, um, or things like you know, want, recognizing I want to cut down on drinking alcohol, but I, I can't cut down on drinking alcohol. So these are three different parts of alcohol use disorder that um, we can get at to, through the questionnaire to better understand how a person's relationship with alcohol is affecting their life. So the way that alcohol use disorder is diagnosed is they ask 11 of these questions of all different uh, pertaining to all different parts of alcohol use disorder. And then they count up the number of yeses the person gives. So if there are no yes answers or one yes answer, the diagnosis is that this person does not have alcohol use disorder. You know, if you only experience one of the symptoms of alcohol use disorder, that's not enough to say you definitely have this. Um, two to three yes answers, so answering yes to two or three questions gives you mild alcohol use disorder. Answering yes to four or five questions gives you moderate alcohol use disorder. And then answering yes to six or more questions gives you severe alcohol use disorder. And a recent study was published <clears throat> last year in 2021 um, by Dr. Manis and colleagues um, the link is cited in the episode description if you want to check it out. Uh, this is the study also that I wrote my uh, postdoc blog piece for. So if you want to check out that piece, I put that link down there too. Um, but this study validated the stratification of AUD severity uh, that was recently implemented by the DSM-5. So previous versions of the DSM only had alcohol use disorder or no alcohol use disorder. But the most recent version, the fifth version, did this stratification of looking at mild, moderate, and severe. And it also, so it validated the stratification, but it also included a question about um, craving to sort of get at the level of dependence. In this study by Dr. Manis and colleagues, um, the researchers aim to explore potential relationships between the severity of alcohol use disorder, whether that's no AUD, mild, moderate, severe, and self-reported measures or external valid of other factors that are referred to as external validators. So these are things like level of alcohol craving, functional impairment, and psychiatric conditions, right? So when the questionnaire for the DSM-5, they're asking, oh, do you drink alcohol even if it makes you feel sad? And the answer is yes or no, right? But what this study was trying to do is to say, okay, if the answer, like if this person has severe alcohol use disorder, are they more sad? Or, you know, if a question is about the alcohol craving, do you want to drink so badly you can't think about anything else? Yes or no they'll correlate that yes or no to how badly, how large the alcohol craving is in a person, right? So they collected the alcohol use disorder diagnosis and these external factors um, in almost 600 participants. And the external factors or the valid external validators were alcohol specific. So that would be something like a craving, um, Psychiatric validators like degree of anxiety or depression um, or and also, not or, and also functioning validators. So they ask questions about social impairments and physical and mental impairments in their day-to-day -day life. So Dr. Manis and colleagues reported that in this cohort of almost 600 people, they found that participants with alcohol use validators, so things like craving, um, binge, drink, binge drinking frequency, problematic use, 
um, they all had a greater likelihood of alcohol use diagnosis with mild, moderate, and severe alcohol use disorder than a no AUD diagnosis. So in other words, people who reported higher binge drinking frequency, they were more likely to be diagnosed with alcohol use disorder than someone who did not report a lot of binge drinking frequency. Um, Psychiatric validators like depression and different types of anxiety also had a greater likelihood of severe alcohol use disorder diagnosis compared to no alcohol use disorder. Um, But this relationship wasn't seen for mild or moderate. So it seems like for psychiatric validators, um, the more severe your alcohol use disorder is, the more likely you are to have other psychiatric effects from your alcohol use disorder. And then lastly, when the, we're thinking about functional validators, that's the social impairments and the, the physical and mental impairments. Um, people who had social, physical, and mental impairments had greater likelihood of having severe alcohol use disorder than not having alcohol use disorder. So again, sort of the same thing as the psychiatric validators, where the people who had a more severe AUD also had more impairment when it came to social, physical, and mental functioning. Um, And this was also not seen in mild or moderate alcohol use disorder patients. Um, So these findings basically from this paper support the structure and the use of the DSM-5 to diagnose alcohol use disorder. Um, It just sort of validated and upheld the change in the DSM structure when it came to alcohol use disorder. Because before it was, you know, alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence, um, but there was no really structure as far as, like, outside of that um, in terms of severity. So this is um, a really interesting way to stratify people who experience alcohol use disorder. And um, this study supported this structure for diagnosis. And diagnosis is important because, you know, if we can diagnose people, we have a better idea of like how to treat them, right? If people have severe alcohol use disorder, they might get a different treatment than someone who only is experiencing mild alcohol use disorder. Um, So the stratification can help in many ways. Um, So now let's get into, I just alluded to treatments. Let's talk about treatments. Um, The good news is that alcohol use disorder is definitely treatable. Um, There are three different categories of treatments that were outlined on the NIAAA website. So the first one that they discussed was behavioral treatments. These are things like counseling and therapy that you can use to change your behavior when it comes to drinking. Therapy is used for, you know, a lot of different things, but in this case, um, someone who has alcohol use disorder can go to therapy to think about their actions when they're, you know, thinking about alcohol and try to uh, cognitively, cognitive behavioral therapy. So try to like cognitively change the way that they think and act about alcohol or around alcohol. Geez, Louise, what's going on with me? The next, um, the next type of, the next type of treatment that they mention is medications. So there are three FDA approved medications to help with alcohol use disorder in the United States. Um, These medications help to Uh, reduce or stop drinking, and also can be used to prevent relapse of alcohol use. So these three drugs are um, disulfram, naltrexone, and (laughs) and a campraset. I honestly... You had me in the first half, then you lost me. I don't know how to pronounce that last one. A, a camprosate. 
a camp receipt. Let's say it's that. Um, but yeah, so medications are available for people who are experiencing alcohol use disorder. Um, this can be used alone or in combination with therapy, um, depending on, you know, what might work best for a person and depending maybe on how severe their alcohol use disorder is. If, you know, I actually, I, I didn't look this up. Maybe I shouldn't be saying it, but hypothetically, maybe it's possible that someone with mild alcohol use disorder who maybe only has, you know, one, two or three of those questions answered yes in the DSM. So maybe only two or three particular, uh, facets of AUD that are relevant to their lives. Um, maybe they just need therapy to like talk it out, work it out. Um, but maybe someone who has more severe would need medicinal intervention in order to, you know, reduce and stop their drinking and then also go to therapy to work out their behavior. Um, and your, yeah, their behavior like long-term. Uh, the last type of ther of treatment that was outlined for AUD was mutual support groups. And these are things like Alcoholics Anonymous um, or peer support groups, essentially, for people who are quitting or cutting back on drinking. Um, they mentioned that it's difficult to say how successful the things like Alcoholics Anonymous is for a person who's struggling with alcohol use because it is anonymous and they can't really keep track of people because they're anonymous. Um, but I mean, I, I think it's a very common thing. I've heard about it a lot, Alcoholics Anonymous. So I feel like if it didn't work, we wouldn't be hearing about it all the time. So, uh, that is another way to, uh, treat or address an alcohol use disorder problem is to use mutual support groups to, um, you know, use each other, people who are also struggling with the same thing that you're struggling to get support, to work through your problems. Um, and then, and this is all just to say, these are, you know, different types of treatments that might not work for everyone who struggles with alcohol use disorder. So it's important that a person starts with their doctor and talks to their primary care physician to evaluate their circumstance, their drinking habits, their lives, and then figure out the plan that works best for them. Um, you know, your primary care physician can suggest therapists and psychiatrists and people, they can prescribe the medications to help you cut back on drinking. Um, if, if you, if they choose to go the, the medicinal route. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a good place to start. I just went to the doctor this week and she asked me about my drinking habits. And I said, I've never heard of alcohol. I don't even know what you're talking about. Just kidding. I was honest with her. I told her socially once in a while, um, nothing excessive. But it's important to talk to your doctor about it because, as we know from the first question, excessive and prolonged use of alcohol has severe impacts on all parts of your body, your liver, your kidneys, your, your heart, your brain. So um, it's important to be honest with your doctor so that they know what to look out for if you're abusing alcohol. The hypothetical you, not you exactly, maybe you exactly, and that's okay. Um, just start with the doctor first so that the doctor can work out a plan that best fits, uh, the person in need to close out this episode. Um, usually I try to keep things light and funny. Um, but sometimes it's hard to do that. Sometimes things aren't light and funny. Um, and alcohol use disorder is one of those things. But I did want to close out this episode by sharing some resources. So if you or someone you know is struggling with alcohol use, um, I have these resources on the slide. I also have them in the episode description. Um, but you can use resources from the NIAAA. Again, that's the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. Um, they have a link that's alcoholtreatment.niaaa.nih.gov where you can look for alcohol treatments near you. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous has their own website, aa.org. 
that you can use to find um, mutual support groups near you. Um, also, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, or SAM, SAM HSA, SAM HSA, um, has a national helpline that is open 24-7, 365. The phone number for that is 1-800-662-HELP or 1-800-662-4357. Or you can go to their website, findtreatment.samhsa.gov to find a treatment center near you. So if you're struggling or if you know someone who's struggling, you're not alone. Um, and there is promise. There is hope for uh, recovery from this. Um, it's definitely treatable and... Um, it's just important that you get the help that you need. So hopefully all of these resources will be helpful. All right. That's all for this week. Um, it's kind of a shorter episode, but I think that's, it's time for a shorter episode because all my previous episodes have been like an hour for the last six episodes. So a short one is good for today. Um, yeah, please don't forget to follow, rate, and review the podcast wherever you're listening. You can also subscribe on YouTube, please. You can also follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Sam Splaining Sci. So you can connect with me there and ask questions if you'd like. You can also submit your questions at samsplainingscience.com slash ask. So if you have anything that you want Sam Splain to you, ask away. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. I hope you learned a little bit and laughed a little bit, and I will talk to you next time. Bye.